Swinburne University of Technology. Those of you who have heard me before know that I typically do not talk about content. I talk about pedagogy. To me, I've devoted most of my career really to changing the approach to teaching and more recently the approach to assessment as well. Um, this talk is an exception because we're going to actually talk about, about content, which is in part motivated by the fact that for the past 24 years, yes, that's right, 24 years, I've been working on, uh, on a textbook, a textbook really to support in some sense what I, um, what I need to accomplish in the classroom. Um, anyway, so that's the subject for, for uh, today. And I want to uh, start by recalling something that happened when I was a student at the University of Leiden taking my first physics course. And I remember you know, starting that course, and the first week and a half were all devoted to vectors. It was all basically algebra, vector algebra. And I was thinking, you know, am I in the right classroom here? The physics. Actually, you know what I should really tell you is that I started out as an astronomy major because I'd been since age five. I was, uh, I was excited by astronomy, and then I enrolled at the University of Leiden, which was the mecca for astronomy. Right? I mean, my, my first astronomy teacher was Jan Oort. He was in his seventies, but, um, and then I had Van der Hulst, radio astronomy, who was teaching another class. But all of a sudden, you know, it all got reduced to right ascensions and declinations and. I, you know, this whole romance I had with the heavens unraveled and, <laughs> and I, 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 I became a physicist and only to discover that, you know, physics was not that much better. It was also you know, just vector algebra. And then came kinematics, which of course is calculus. And then all of a sudden out of the blue sky came Newton's laws, differential equations. And then came momentum and then came collisions and then came work. And then came energy. Now we're, what, six, seven weeks into the semester? And I remember at that point, and you may remember that from your own course or from the course you teach, the instructors say, now that we have energy and momentum, we have the two basic conservation principles, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. And now we can do in just three lines, we can solve all those problems that took a page and a half to solve using just algebra. Remember that? <coughs> or you may know it from your book. And I remember thinking then as a student, you know, why in the world didn't we start the easy way? <laughs> why do it the hard way before you do it the easy way? I was too shy to raise my hand and ask that question. Then years later, I was teaching out of Howell in Resnick um, the first course I was assigned to teach at Harvard, and of course I followed the historical approach, which incidentally dates back to the middle of the 19th century. I got my hands on a book by a French author by the name of Alphonse Ganot. I, uh, Harvard has the 16th edition, believe it or not. It's this thick. It's smaller. It has a trim size. That's about. It's not like, you know, the, the modern textbooks. But you open it up on the table of contents. It's identical to Helden and Resnick. You know, kinematics, uh, Newton's laws, collisions. I mean, same thing. The only difference is that energy does not appear in the book. I was kind of shocked by that. But energy did not make its way into physics until the end of the 19th century. In fact, it's a relatively, if you call, um, if you call the photoelectric effect modern, then you know you might as well call energy modern too, because it's only a few decades uh, decades apart. Um, anyway, the only exception is Ernst Mach. Ernst Mach published his lectures in 1885, I think, and uh, it's a book that was used quite well around the turn of the century. Einstein learned physics from Ernst Mach's book. Ernst Mach starts actually out with collisions carts on low friction tracks, which apparently they have been in use for over 100 years. And he shows experimentally that momentum is conserved. I'll show you later how he does that, because that I basically adopted his approach. 
But then he does Newton's laws, and then he does work in energy, and then he does conservation energy. So in a sense, it's a hybrid approach, right? Algebra, calculus, algebra. So when I started writing my book 24 years ago, um, well, Prentice Hall twisted my arm to write a textbook. And I told you already in my previous talk that there's a word that I have trouble pronouncing. And it dates back to a long time ago, that, that trouble that I had. So I just signed the contract without really knowing what I would get into. But anyway, as I started writing, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be really nice if we could start with just algebra and just the conservation? But after all, the conservation principles really transcend all of physics. I mean, how many of you physicists here use the word force in your professional lives? Probably very little, right? But much less than we do it in our curriculum. So the answer to that is we can. It, it took 24 hours, but uh, 24 uh, years, pardon me. I wish it took 24 hours, but we, we can. And this is not the cover of the global edition that, that is out here. I hadn't seen that until I, I uh, came here. But um, after 24 years, I, I finally have it written down the way uh, I want it. So in, in this book, we start with conservation and the conservation energy, putting both on an experimental footing. Right? So it's experiments that inform you that momentum and energy are conserved. Then I talk about interactions, force, and work. Now you may wonder, what about engineers? Well, I teach engineers. Shouldn't engineers know about force? Of course. It's not that I don't do force. It's right there. I just place it, place it on a much more solid footing. But it actually turns out that the engineers were on to this before I was. There's this book called Conservation Principles and the Structure of Engineering, a textbook. This is the fifth edition, which basically builds up all of engineering using systems and balance equations and conservation principles. The only difference with my book is that they don't really show an experimental basis for the conservation principles. They just state them. I think it's better to invoke experimental evidence because that's, I think, the nature of, uh, of physics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the architecture of the book, how did I structure it, and then about I'll tell you a little bit about the content, as in particular, how do we do conservation laws first. And I end up by showing some results that I didn't show in my previous talk. Hopefully, there'll be time left this time. So first of all, why are there two books? You saw that here, too. In the US, it's a white and a, and a black book. Well, the two books have a slightly different title, or the emphasis on a different word. One is the principles, uh, the white book in this case. And um, the second book is the practice, right? In a typical textbook, you have text, problems, text, problems interwoven. To the student, the problems are often the most important part of the book because that's how they're going to be assessed. It's the proverbial tail that wags the dog. Um, the problems, is, you know, and typically it's 10, 15 pages in a textbook, interrupt the flow. So I thought, let me pull them out so that I have one book that sort of coherently explains all of the physics, and then I can maybe do a little bit more with these end of chapter problems, putting them together in a separate thing. So I think it's more logical in a sense. It provides more unity of the physics, because the physics is one narrative, right? The division in chapters is fairly artificial anyway. Also, it means that students can use the different books in different contexts, right? If you're solving a problem in a, in a discussion section, you might only want to bring that second volume, or you might want to keep the volume open and refer to the first volume without losing your page. Actually, many students have commented on that being a, uh, a handy uh, feature. So let's first turn to the principles volume. And apart from the cover, the inside of the book is, uh, is the same, as far as I can tell. I haven't really put the, the things uh, next to each other. Each chapter has a chapter opener. And if you look at the table of content of that chapter opener, you see that it's split into two sections, a conceptual section and a quantitative section. Every chapter starts with a conceptual section and then has uh, a quantitative section after that. And if you open the book on one of the pages of the conceptual section, what uh, may strike you is that it's set in two columns rather than one column as a standard textbook and that it has just words and images, no equations. The idea is to teach the concepts, 
using just verbal and visual representation. By the way, there's one book that we physicists all love that also has more words than equations. What am I referring to? Feynman lectures. I mean, in fact, Feynman lectures, the percentage of word-only pages to equation pages is two to three, so he pushed it even further than, than, than I did. And I think he, he correctly points out that the language of physics is not mathematics. The language of physics is English, at least in the English-speaking <laughs> uh, world, right? You have to understand the ideas before you just start manipulating the equation. And how many of our students just start manipulating equations without even understanding the meaning of the symbols. So the idea is really to lay the groundwork there. Then, you know, there's a self quiz, I'll skip that. And then when you get to the quantitative part uh, and open a page on the quantitative part, it looks more like a standard textbook. It's, you know, a single column with a wide margin, displayed equations. And the idea is just to use the conceptual understanding that's been built up in the first part of the chapter to develop the uh, quantitative tools. Now, students don't know how to read, right? Um, I, I, I talked about the annotation. <laughs> At least they don't know how to read a textbook. They'll read it the same way they read a novel, without pausing, thinking, and reflecting. So I built reflection into the textbook. You heard my previous talk about reflection. Well, I built it into the textbook. So in each chapter, sprinkled throughout the chapter, there are these checkpoints, a little hand symbol that says, you know, stop and think. And the stopping and thinking is induced by asking questions, which probably is not that surprise for somebody who has made his career out of uh, teaching through questioning. Um, and I, made, I put these questions in in such a way that it's hard just to read past them. Right after it may say, the answer to this checkpoint may surprise you if you haven't done it, there's nothing that surprises you. Or, as this checkpoint shows, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, that if you haven't done it, it sort of forces you back. I think this one here says, what does it say? Don't skip checkpoint 10.5. Well, harder to understand the rest of this section if you haven't thought about this. So I always try to, you know, sort of point back to it. There are about 30 of them per chapter, so close to 1,000 in the entire book. What if you don't know the answer? No problem, there's a section at the end of the principles volume that has every single checkpoint worked out in, uh, in detail. Initially, I didn't have any worked examples in the principles book, but then the publisher convinced me it would be a good idea, and I think I agree. There has to be some transition and connection between the two. So I put in um, worked examples. This is actually the shortest worked example in the entire textbook. Um, I use that because that means I can blow it up. For each and every worked example, I followed Polya's uh, stepwise approach to solving problems. I don't know if you know, Polya was a mathematician in the 1950s in the US, and he wrote this beautiful little book, which you can download from the internet now, How to Solve It, where he lays out a strategy for stepwise problem solving. I simplified the strategy a little bit. I went from five to four steps. Um, but basically, they're listed there, getting started, devise a plan, execute a plan, and evaluate the result. If you were there in my previous talk, you recognized that, you know, the connection to the way I had my students solve problems. So your checkpoints at the end, yeah. do you have any data, anecdotal or quantitative, about what students who actually read them through the textbook, do they just all stop and actually work through all these, or do they have a tendency to want to skip through them? Yeah. So I, that's a very good question because I'm very curious about that. And until recently, I didn't know how to really get to the answer. And I, I've, learned, I've learned not to rely on anecdotal data. You know, Lee Shulman, <coughs> when, when, who was the president of the Carnegie Foundation, once said, the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anecdotal data is dangerous, I know. So, but, but right now, we have the annotations. So. What I do in, I, I don't upload the solutions to the checkpoints <coughs> in the digital version that's online. So the students have the question, but not the solution. They could go to the print version, but there's only the question. So I can look at the annotations that pertain to, to the checkpoints. Right? And so what, we f what I find is that there are a substantial <coughs> number of annotations that are about the checkpoint, where students are wondering about the answer, or they don't understand my explanation in the answer to the checkpoint. By the way, 
if you ever want to write a book, that annotation software is the best way to actually tailor your writing to the needs of the students. I've used it now for probably five years, or and, and before that I had, I had something similar, but without them actually annotating the digital copy. You actually get a window into the minds of the students while they're reading your book. It's fantastic. So I know that at least some of them are reading it, but I don't have any quantitative data yet. So it's a platform. So so it's a platform that we're, we'll we'll make it available in August. Uh, right now, it's not yet scalable. We can I, I can. There are quite a number of annotation platforms like nb.mit.edu, but they will not do any of the processing of the annotations. You'd have to process it yourself. Yeah. I also want to draw your attention to the art. There are about 3,000 illustrations in the book, and I drew every single one of them. <laughs> now you understand why it took 24 years. In fact, <laughs> I'm a very visual person, and um, so I started each chapter by laying it out on six pages or so. I would put all the illustrations on six pages. This is one of them. And I used Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and taught myself Illustrator and Photoshop. It was a very useful skill, actually. And, um, and I laid out the entire chapter visually. Those of you who may have heard my Millikan Award medal talk for the APT called The Make-Believe World of Real World Physics know that I also studied the efficacy of science illustrations. And in fact, pointed out in that talk, if, if you haven't seen that talk, it's a very funny talk because I go around sort of interviewing people at Harvard Square and also some of my colleagues at Harvard and MIT um, is, is on my website. So if you go to ericmazur.com and you go to videos, there's the make-believe world of real-world physics. Let me give you an example. In one of the current physics textbooks, I won't name the publisher, there's this basketball player dropping a ball while walking. The purpose of that illustration is to show a parabolic trajectory. So let me just try to reenact that illustration, okay? I, I wish I had it in my talk, but I'll just reenact it, okay? So he is a tall guy in his shorts, realistically rendered. You can see Nike shoes and bushes in the background. Everything screams real world, okay? So here he goes. He walks, and then after a step or two, he releases the ball. And he takes another step, and the ball drops. And it drops. And it drops. <laughs> and it drops. <laughs> and it drops, and it drops. And finally, after 10 steps, <coughs> it hits the ground. Do you know what gravity, what G is for it <laughs> to take? It's 0 0.01 meter per second square. I mean, even on Pluto, gravitation is higher than <laughs> that to justify that trajectory. <laughs> so anyway, so I took a drawing like that where I had a person actually not walking but running. And I had the trajectory going forward, and one straight down, and one going backward, A, A B, C. And um, I um, asked people in Harvard Square, you know, on camera, it was micro, you know, which of these three trajectories, A, B, C, is closest to the actual trajectory taken by the ball? And almost everybody says B, straight down. So I tell them, you know, what would you say if I told you that most physicists would say A? I'd be concerned for the world of physics, <laughs> says one person. <laughs> or another person who says, it can't be that way because you'd have to push it forward for it to go that far forward. Anyway, I filmed the actual trajectory and, you know, even if you run, it's maybe at most this distance because it takes a quarter second, right? So, so the trajectory is actually way closer to the one straight down than it is to the one the parallel. So then I went to my colleagues at Harvard and at MIT and I interviewed them, including a Nobel laureate, and I asked them to choose which trajectory, right? And they all say, A. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tell them, you know, what would you say if I told you that B is actually closer to the actual trajectory? Well, you can see their, their reactions on, uh, on, that, uh, on that video. So what does this tell us? <laughs> this tells us that the layperson chooses the trajectory not based on the model, but based on 
the actual trajectory, which is closer to straight down than it is to this ridiculous parabolic trajectory shown in a textbook. But the other interesting thing it tells us is that the physicist, we, you and I, choose the trajectory based on the model rather than the reality, even if the model has been shown in a completely unrealistic way. To us, you know, of course, parabolic. And we don't, we forget to think, oh no, I got you'd have to be, you know, on some asteroid in order for it to be that way. Um, now imagine you're a student. You pay uh, whatever, $100 or $150 for this textbook. You go home, you take the shrink rack off, you open it up, and the first illustration you see is that basketball player dropping the ball, and it's this ridiculous trajectory which you know from intuition can't be right. What do you conclude? The whole picture streams real world, but the trajectory is ridiculous. You think, you know, these physicists are out of their minds, or I don't understand physics. And you know, I'm just giving you one example. There are many more in, 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 in that talk. It's horrendous how unrealistically the physics is represented, even though there's this attempt, this gratuitous attempt, at realistically rendering people and so on. It's just, just amazing, right? I mean, you, 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 you put the students already in a very strange mood, right, just by having to say, you know, by the way, the publisher was there when I gave that talk in Edmonton. Um, you know how they solved the problem? They put the uh, guy on a skateboard. <laughs> the skateboard would have to go about 200 kilometers an hour for the trajectory to be, <laughs> to be uh, in that way. Anyway, I made sure that uh, I basically kept everything simple. I was not going to show realism by realistic rendering of people, which has another problem. If you look at those eye trackers, at students looking at that illustration, for example, another illustration, when you realistically render a figure, it becomes a magnet for the eyes. We are biologically pre-programmed to look at other people. So you realistically render a person, and whether you want it or not, this is not something you consciously control, you basically start scanning that person. And you spend most of your visual time looking at the person rather than looking at the physics. So I just have stick figures. So if you're a woman, you can see a woman there. If you're a man, you can see a man there. Gender and minority issues solved, and there are no distractions. I also made sure that it was always correct, so I modeled it or I simulated it or I photographed it in order to realistically show uh, the different things. So in the principles volume, concepts before quantitative tools, these checkpoint and worked examples to promote thinking. And then I based my illustrations on, on research as well as the pedagogy. I didn't really talk about that yet, but um, that's kind of obvious given the effort I've put into it. What about the practice volume? Well, for each chapter in the principles volume, there's a corresponding chapter in the practice volume. So this is the opening page of chapter 17, which now instead of having concepts and quantitative tools just as practice. And most of the sections will look familiar, but there are a couple of sections that I'm really proud of. Uh, and I think I, it w I wouldn't have been able to do that had I not pulled everything out. One is developing a feel. I already alluded to the importance of estimation skills in my first uh, talk, but I thought, you know, when you start talking about momentum or energy or, or any other quantity in physics, it's good to develop some sort of quantitative, not no, or semi-quantitative, I should say, order of magnitude type of idea of what these quantities are. Momentum, well, what's the momentum of a mosquito? What's the momentum of a speeding train? What is the momentum of an airliner uh, flyer? So that you get some idea of the orders of magnitude, not by guessing, but by basically using estimation skills. So each chapter starts with a section, it's developing a field, and at the top there are 10 or 12 quantities that the students need to estimate. Notice that at the end of each of these um, questions, there's a series of letters. G, X, you might not be able to read it from there, N, U. Or the first one, let's look at the first one right there. It has the letter D and P. The question is, I can read it here, it's hard to read from there. The speed V of a point on the equator as Earth rotates. No idea. Well, if you have no idea, you take the first letter there, D, and you go to a hint. But the hint is, again, a question. It says, 
What is the Earth's rotational speed? No clue. Okay, then you could just go to the answer. It says the period is 24 hours, and therefore omega is blah, blah, blah. <coughs> oh, yeah, now I can solve it. Or maybe you're still stuck. If you're still stuck, you go to the next letter. What is the Earth's radius? I don't know. No one ever told me. Uh, well, it's 6 times 10 to the 6 meters. So it basically feeds the students little bits of information, the same way you would do if the student came to your office and said, uh, Professor, I don't know how to do this problem. Well, you wouldn't just solve the problem for the student. You would basically semi-Socratically teach the student by asking questions. In a sense, this is that in print. The other thing is the worked and guided problems. We already talked about worked problems, and, and there are worked problems many more in, in, the, in the practice volume. But you know, typically, and that's of course true in most textbooks, but typically there is nothing padding the step between a work problem and a problem that the students do on their own, right? I mean, you work a few problems, and then you tell the student, do it on your own. Well, I mean, you wouldn't do that with most other things, right? If you teach somebody swimming, you wouldn't say, stand there and jump in the pool and swim, and then say, okay, your turn, right? I mean. That would not work that well. So basically, each worked problem, again, done in four steps, is uh, followed by a guided problem. And the guided problem also has the four steps, getting started, devise a plan, but it doesn't have it worked out. The student is guided through questions on how to carry out each of these steps. This is where we pad the transition between worked and, uh, and um, you know, unworked problems. And the idea, of course, is to teach by, by questioning. So it's not just end of chapter material in that second book. I could have done that, just pulled out the problems, stapled them together. But I, I wanted to add some innovative features, features and really also try to teach them authentic problem solving. I mean, there are many books that have four-step or multi-step approaches to solving problems. But you look in detail, you find that the author sometimes omits step one or step four because he or she couldn't come up with, I mean, listen, if you teach if you teach a stepwise procedure for solving problems, you better set the right example and do it. So let's talk about the cons uh, contents. Um, how do you do the, principle, the conservation principles before uh, Newton's laws of physics? So let's quickly run you through the chapter. Chapter one, foundations. I'm actually very proud of that chapter. It's the last chapter I wrote. It's not the first chapter, it's the last chapter I wrote. I thought I have to write the book before I know what, I re what you really need to put in one of these first chapters. I've looked at many first chapters and I thought, God, it's just a grab bag of, of things. And I decided that what I needed to really explain is, you know, about the philosophy of physics and about symmetry. Symmetry is such an important idea in physics, especially if you connect it, of course, to the conservation principles. Um, and typically in a physics textbook, it's not discussed until Gauss's law, and then it becomes something completely mathematical, whereas you know, every person knows intuitively something about symmetry. So why not bring that out early on? And then time, as somebody who's active in ultrafast spectroscopy and you know, measuring in femtoseconds, I've always been fascinated by the concept of time. And you, I urge you, after my talk, to go back and pull out the introductory physics textbook you use, look up time in the index, and then see what the author says there. Nothing. Time is never defined. Time is basically that, whatever people's intuitive notion of time is, whatever is measured by their watches around their wrists. But let's face it, physics is the science of change. Therefore, time is probably the most important parameter in the whole field. And time is not just whatever is measured by clocks. It's really a parameter that permits us to separate cause and effect. And therefore, the idea of causality should really be discussed right there. You don't have to wait till special relativity to do that. Already, you know, <laughs> in, in, in classical mechanics, the principle of causality and time are interwoven. So I do that right then and there. I discuss also this four-step problem-solving procedure, right? because you can't really start teaching it. Of course, there's no physics there to start teaching it with yet. 
but you can apply the same four-step procedure to logical problems, so I give a couple of examples there. And the estimation skills are also there. There's a beautiful book by Sanjoy Mahajan, I don't know if you know it, Street Fighting Mathematics, in which he basically, he was a student of Hopfield and then became a teacher at MIT. And he basically teaches estimation skills in a beautiful way, much more profound than I could possibly do, but at least I want to get the basics to my students about how to develop these estimation skills. Then comes kinematics. You have to do kinematics before you do anything. Unfortunately, I can't throw that out. There's no momentum or energy without kinematics. Um, pretty standard, except that there's still this distribution, this, this, this division between concepts and quantitative skills. And, and you can't really see that here. I do it all in one dimension, only. In fact, the first nine chapters of the book are all in one dimension only. That doesn't mean that you have to do everything along the horizontal. You can do it along the vertical or even an inclined plane. You just can't do parabolic motion or circular motion. Why did I do that? I did that because if you do two dimensions, you have to put in vectors in one and one dimension and add this whole vector algebra that derails the students right at the beginning of the, of the course, even Harvard students. Maybe not physics majors, but at least engineering and pre-med. And what do we do when we solve a two-dimensional problem? Well, we have a two-dimensional problem. We split it into two one-dimensional so problems, then solve the two one-dimensional problems, and then recombine the answers at the end. So you really need to know quite well how to solve a one-dimensional problem before you do a two-dimensional problem. So why not develop all the physics, including momentum, energy, collisions, in one dimension before bringing in the whole baggage of the two-dimensional approach? Now, since my manuscript started leaking out 10, 15 years ago, other authors have followed suit, and they were a little bit faster than me. So there are already a few books that, that do that too, because I really think that makes a lot of sense, right? Physics is not about solving complicated math problems. So physics is about understanding the laws of physics. Yeah? How did you decide on your representation of things like Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for asking that. So I decided to have a very explicit notation. I will not use T for time, period, or, or, or difference, whereas there are, a lot of, there are a lot of books that use T for an interval, but at the same time they use T for an instant. So, and, and given that delta, the capital delta, change, is very important in conservation principle. I did that very systematically with time and other quantities as well. Force, I don't have a shortcut of using N for normal force, T for tension, W for weight or gravity or whatever you really want to indicate there. I made sure that every force has two subscripts, by, on, and it has a subscript that indicates the nature of the force. Cumbersome, if you're a physicist, but crucial if you're a beginning learner because you can keep the things apart. Why do many students get confused with T and N and W? Because they, don't, they forget along the way which object is exerting the force on what other object. Uh, energy, same thing. So, so, so I basically classify the energy. I won't be able to get to it. I classify the energy into four categories, coherent and incoherent and motion and state. We'll get to that in just a second. And I have letters for each, and I, I, I use that consistently. Uh, I'll get to that in, in, in just a second in a very superficial way. I don't want to make this too long. Let's get to momentum first. Here I follow, that's the fourth chapter, I follow basically Ernst Mach's prescription by looking at collisions. And I want to emphasize a few things. So, so Ernst Mach introduces this idea of inertial mass early on in his book. He doesn't talk about systems. System is another of these, uh, these concepts in physics that I think is crucially important. And you look, most author will have one or two sentences to describe what is meant by system. But if you check with students, they have a lot of trouble. What is a system? Why do you use a, How do you choose a system? So I made sure that I had a whole section, uh, in fact, there's more than that section, dealing with the articulation of the idea of a system, 
And more importantly, the idea of, and I never realized until after I wrote the third version, third, I mean, you may think this is a first edition. It's really a third or a fourth edition because I class tested it for, for 20 some years. Um, uh, how important the concept is of extensive quantity. I learned it personally when I got into thermodynamics. It was the first time I encountered extensive and ex intensive quantities, but if you stop to think about it, understanding an extensive quantity is crucially important for any conservation principle because you cannot really understand a conservation principle unless you wrap your head around the idea of an extensive quantity. So that's in there, in there too. So for collisions, I basically went to the Harold Edgerton uh, high-speed film lab at MIT. They have these cameras that film 10,000 frames a second. So you, you film a collision between uh, two Pasco cards. These show one out of every 30 frames or so. And um, if you connect the fronts and the backs of the cards and you turn your head 90 degrees, you basically have the position versus time graph. And the beauty of high-speed photography is that you can actually see the bending. You do, it, you do the collision and it's pack, right? I mean, instantaneous. And you look there and it's hundreds of frames. You can see, even though you, know, you can't really see the hard plastic deform, you see one card slow down and the other accelerate during the collision. The beauty is that in the 25 years that I took to write my book, these things came out, which now film at 240 frames per second. And even with 240 frames per second, you can actually see the uh, 20 or so millisecond that the collision takes. So you can actually show to the student it's not instantaneous. It actually is slow transfer of, uh, of energy and momentum, although those terms are not yet uh, in there. We can represent that differently. Incoming card hitting a car at rest. And what do you find? You find that the velocity swap if they're two identical cards. And you don't have to have one at rest. If we give the one a little shove and the other catching up with it, again, the two cards simply swap velocity. So when you have two identical cards colliding, they swap velocity. Now what if we have unequal cards? So we take a double card, we glue two together, or we put a little bit of Velcro in between, um, and what happens is not that they swap velocity anymore. But what you find is that the double card has a change in velocity that is half, or speed I should say, that is half the change in speed of the single card. So, and if you take three cards, you would find it's a third. So if we define one card as the inertial standard, the kilogram, unfortunately they're not a kilogram, but be nice, then we could take any random card and express its resist resistance to a change in motion simply by measuring the velocity change in a collision. So then I bring in extensive quantities and, and I tell them basically what extensive quantities are. And as an example, I use the number of trees in a park. Well, if we take this as 10 trees, if we cut this park in two and we count the trees in one half, and then or in one part, pardon me, and in the other part, then we add them, then we get the number of trees in the park, no matter how we split the park into parts which is the definition of an extensive quantity. How can that quantity, the number of trees in a park, change? Let's say that we look at the park sometime later. Well, the number of trees in the park does not have to be the same. How can that extensive quantity, number of trees in the park, or any other extensive quantity in some kind of a <coughs> system change? Well, it can change through two processes. One is through flow, input or output. Somebody can carry a tree into the park and plant it, or somebody can uproot a tree and carry it out. Or through creation or destruction. A tree can die or a tree can grow from a seed. It turns out, however, that there are a number of quantities that can be neither created nor destroyed. In that case, we call it a conserved quantity, which doesn't mean it can't change. And you'll find a lot of textbooks actually confuse the word conserved and constant. I looked back at a lot of books and I thought, how did I ever figure that out? Because the author confuses the word constant and conserved. And I think I often find myself pronouncing the wrong word now as a consequence. I'll say, you know, conserved quantity is constant. No, it's only constant when the system is isolated and there is no flow, right? If there's a flow, it can still change. Um, but anyway, 
If you have an isolated system, then that conserved quantity is constant, which permits us to quickly compute uh, changes. And one of such quantity is momentum. And I show that experimentally the same way Ernst Mach does it. You take a collision between two unknown cards. You independently determine the inertial mass of each of these two cards for colliding it with the inertial standard. And then you can plot m times v for each of those two cards. And what do you find? You find that delta p1 plus delta p2 equals 0. And to show how really beautifully that works, you change the collision between those two cards by putting a little bit of Velcro between them. You can do it in the classroom in front of them. In fact, we'll make the videos available, but it's much more fun to actually do it. And the collision changes completely, but those delta P1 plus delta P2 still add up to zero. No matter what you do, you find out that it always adds up to zero. So then I get to energy, and that cost me a while because I, there was nothing to base myself on. So, but it turns out that in the end, the answer was very simple. And I think it leads to a definition of energy that's much more compatible with modern physics, with thermodynamics, quantum mechanics. I mean, it basically, I don't use those words, but it basically introduces internal energy as a state function. And the argument I use up there was something that was actually known in the 17th century. Christian Huygens, who I, I grew up three blocks from where he used to live, 300 years separated in time, but in The Hague, in the Netherlands, he had actually noticed that in, a, in an elastic collision, the relative velocity of the two colliding objects remains constant. Think, for example, you know, of Newton's cradle or any other collision like the one shown here. And it's not only between objects of the same m, it's also between two objects of n equal. That relative velocity is unchanged. He even gave it a name, vis viva, in one manuscript I saw that. And then that vis viva got later used by Newton for something else, and then later got completely forgotten. So in an elastic collision, the hallmark is that V12i equals V12f. The relative speed between the two objects, initial and final, is the same. There again, you see the explicit notation I use. Yeah? Okay. Now, that's not a conservation principle. Besides, you know, there are not only elastic collisions, there are also inelastic collisions. But if we combine that with conservation of momentum, then if we combine these two equations, in two lines we can show that that is true. Actually, you find this mathematics in most textbooks, but it's reversed. The author will say, in an elastic collision, kinetic energy is constant. Worse, some will actually write down kinetic energy is conserved. Ugh. It's never conserved. Kinetic energy is not a conserved quantity. Energy is, but kinetic energy is not. It's constant. All right, let's shove that under the rug. And then they combine that with momentum conservation to show that the relative velocity is unchanged in an elastic. But isn't that weird? I mean, you can see with your eyes that the relative velocity is unchanged. You cannot see with your eyes that. So somehow the logic got inverted over the centuries. And instead of going with something that's observable, you go with something extremely abstract like kinetic energy. <laughs> OK, we still don't have a conservation principle. This at least, this is not an extensive quantity. This is an extensive quantity. but. In an inelastic collision, this doesn't hold, so it cannot be a conservation principle. Plus, what happens to kinetic energy in collisions that are not elastic? Well, let's look at elastic versus inelastic. There's something peculiar about these pictures. And what is peculiar about these pictures is that in one, you can tell the direction of time. In the other, you cannot. The one on the left is definitely taken after the collision, not before. Whereas the one on the right, you cannot tell what is before or after. Why is that? That's because on the left, the state of the object has changed. The cars are different after the collisions than before. Whereas on the right, the tennis ball is the same before and after, and the racket is the same before and after. Yes? Um, I beg your pardon? Often the ball 
it's, it's distorted only during the collision, not after. And yes, it's spinning. We'll shove that under the rug for now. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll do this as follows in the classroom, OK? I take two cards. I make them collide inelastically because I put some Velcro in between, right? So, so you have this. I film it, and then I play it backwards. And the students right away see, well, <laughs> time is backwards. You take an, inel an elastic collision and you film that, and you play it backward, you can't tell what is forward and backward. So the big hallmark is this. Let's make a, is, is that elastic collisions are reversible, whereas inelastic collisions are irreversible. So let's make a table. If you have an elastic collision, the relative speed is unchanged, and therefore kinetic energy is the same before and after the collision. But the state of the object is also unchanged. In an inelastic collision, the Relative speed has changed, and therefore we know that the kinetic energy has decreased. Something's gone away. Where has it gone? It has gone into changing the state of the object. So I basically introduced there the internal energy as a state function. And of course, in the beginning, we can't calculate this except by calculating indirectly through conservation of energy. Um, then I get to uh, Galilean relativity. This is a chapter you could possibly skip if you want. Then I get to interactions. I want to get this idea of interactions before force. Force, in a sense, is a disembodied interaction. And we know from research how much problems students have with Newton's third law. And the reason is they don't see it as an interaction. They see it as this disembodied interaction that only acts on one object. And this permits me to actually introduce the first internal energy. And then again, an experiment I do in front of the students. Cart coming in at a constant speed on the track hits a spring. So it has a constant kinetic energy in the beginning. Until it hits a spring and starts compressing the spring, it slows down, kinetic energy goes away. Compresses, it's gone away completely. But then mysteriously it reappears as the spring expands expands again. Where has this energy gone? It has gone into changing the state of the spring. So I can associate an internal energy, which I call potential energy because it's a reversible state change, with that energy. And we can calculate it quantitatively now because we know the kinematics of, of, of that constant acceleration. So that's when I get to this classification of energy. I'm not going to go through this because I, I spoke a little bit slower than I want, but basically we have energy of configuration, energy of motion, coherent and incoherent. And I can basically do what Alan van Heuvelen does so beautifully in some of his work where I describe interactions by s energy sloshing back and forth between these four different um, uh, categories of energy. And actually students can get quite good at recognizing you know, these four different categories of energy and identifying interactions according to, to make these qualitative uh, diagrams of, 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 of energy changes happening before they get to a quantitative description. Then I get to force. And from there on, it's, we're pretty much on the standard track. So how do I introduce fo force? I say, say you're on a, on a bicycle going down a mountain, right, and you get to a hairpin turn. And as you head into this high hairpin turn, to your horror, it, it, you notice that your brakes are no longer working. There's a rock wall right in front of you. There's no way you're going to avoid that rock wall. But for some reason, somebody has padded part of that rock wall with a mattress. What do you head for? The rock wall, the bare rock wall, or the part that has been padded by a mattress? Well, you don't need to have taken physics to know that you're better off taking, doing, hitting the mattress. So what's the difference? When you hit the mattress, what's your change in momentum? MV. When you hit the rock wall, what's your change in momentum? MV. What's your change in kinetic energy? Same in both cases. So what's the difference? The difference is the rate at which that energy exchange takes, uh, that, um, that momentum uh, change takes place. So essentially, Newton's second law in my book is a definition, hence the three lines there. It's a definition, not a law. Newton's third law is simply a consequence of conservation of momentum, which is an experimental fact. Now, in the standard book, Newton's third law yields conservation of momentum. And research has shown that students have a lot of trouble with Newton's third law. So it puts conservation of momentum on a pretty shaky footing. And Newton's first law is simply a state about reference frames, which we did in the Galilean relativity uh, chapter.
So then comes work, and then we're basically on the same track. So how much work is it to switch? And you know, there are a lot of great physics textbooks, like the Feynman Lectures. I don't know if you have this book here in Australia. There, there you go, my favorite. Um, and you know, Six Ideas That Shaped Physics. They're all great books, but they leave so little solid ground under, uh, under, under your feet, because you, know, you, you really need to throw out everything you've done before in order to uh, adopt those. So I, s I, I was willing to make some changes, but I want to stay not too far from the beaten track. So this is a traditional textbook. I don't know, this might be Knight or other than Resnick, I don't know. And here's my book. So what are some of the differences? One is the whole first part is in one dimension, which means I can't do vectors in two dimensions until chapter 10. And I can't do s uh, motion in two dimensions until chapter 10. And I can't do circular motion, so that has to go a little bit later. I do conservation before dynamics, whereas most books do dynamics before conservation. It has a huge advantage. I don't know about you, but for us, calculus is often a co-requisite rather than a prerequisite. In other words, students can take the calculus course together with their physics course in the same semester. But often the calculus course takes off less fast than the physics course, and the students are really still struggling with their calculus concepts before they're used in physics. H you're pushing that back here. There's a buffer during which the students can catch up with their calculus. Then everything is rotation is together, and everything is periodic is actually much better together than in a standard textbook. So it's mostly minor rearrangement, and there are a lot of ways of tailoring, as explained in the beginning of the book. This is not in the book, <laughs> but I want to, for those physicists among you, briefly uh, show the relationships to Emmy Noether's work. Emmy Noether showed in the uh, late, uh, at the beginning of the, the 20th century, how every conservation principle has a related symmetry principle. But if you look at her derivation, it presupposes the laws of mechanics. It's not really articulated that way, but you look at the derivation, it does. And it turns out that you could take these three things, mechanics, symmetry, conservation, as sort of three pillars, and any combination of two shows the third. She happens to have chosen symmetry and mechanics to show conservation. In some ways, I have inverted that argument in the book. I, again, I don't say that to the students, but that's what I've done. I've taken symmetry and conservation and derived from it the laws of mechanics. And I think there's a certain aesthetic appeal in that, right? I mean, imagine you've not learned any physics. Mechanics, I mean, why would mechanics be true? Symmetry, doing an experiment here and then there and finding the same thing, or doing an experiment here now and 10 years from now and finding the same thing, is aesthetically appealing. The fact that there are certain things in this changing universe that are immutable is also appealing. So I think there's a, there's a certain aesthetic appeal in having done it that way rather than uh, the standard way. So where's modern physics? To which I say, what do we really mean by modern? All these dead white males are much older than my grandfather. Uh, to me, all of physics is modern. So I sprinkled modern physics throughout, building physics up from conservation principle using universality and particle interactions early on, put concepts of general relativity in the gravitation chapter where they really belong. If you don't want to do them, no problem. They're the last sections of the conceptual and the quantitative part, so you can easily throw them out. Special relativity is not an appendix. It's the last chapter of the mechanics chapter where it belongs. It's simply mechanics at high speed. If you don't want to do it, you can easily skip it. For thermal, I wish we could talk about thermal. I took three years for the three thermal chapters because I wanted to completely rewrite it. Rather than doing the historical approach with, with you know, machines and so on, let's start with a statistical foundation. Alan Leitman, who's a professor at MIT, wrote a beautiful book for lay people called Six Ideas in Physics. Or, no, sorry, Great Ideas in Physics. And he has a chapter beautifully explaining entropy to a lay person. So I use that as a foundation for that chapter. I put the relativistic connection between electricity and magnetism there where magnetism is, using Purcell's argument about an electron moving next to a wire, further simplifying it so I could bring it down to this level. Semiconductors, transistors, logic gates are right there, and then photons and particle interference are in uh, chapter 34. There's an instructor manual in which I provide a lot of support for teaching from this book as well. 
as learning analytics that has all of my interactive questions, and you've seen the role that that plays in my uh, current course. But in the end, the book really has to work for students, right? I mean, it might appeal to you now. If it doesn't work for students, it's not going to really help it. So um, I decided to, and it, it, it has to impact the learning, really. That's what we wanted to do. So these are the data I promised in the previous talk and didn't show. This shows, for the fall semester, the normalized gain obtained in three different courses. The first one is a course for pre-medical students, a lecture-based course, calculus. The book used here, I think, was Jen Coley. Um, typically, in a lecture-based course, the normalized gain on the FCR, on the Force Concept Inventory, is 25%. So whatever this instructor did was really, really very good. Right, you give a pretest and a post-test. You look at the data in the beginning of the semester and the end of the semester, and then you divide the gain by the maximum possible gain so that you can compare different populations of students. This was the precursor of AP50, which I described in my previous talk, Mechanics for Engineering Students. Uh, it was not taught by me. This is a six-year average. This is a six-year average. So it was not taught by me. It was taught by one of my colleagues who reverted the course back to its lecture format after I abandoned this course. So much for educational innovations, right? And uh, in AP 50, where the students only read the book, there are no lectures, as you heard in the previous talk, this is the, f a the FCI normalized gain for the first two uh, uh, years. I don't have this year's data in there yet. So it was the largest conceptual gain in any course taught at Harvard over the past six years. What about uh, the spring semester? We used the conceptual survey of electricity and magnetism. I had taught this course, so this is actually my data. Uh, doing my absolute best in the classroom, using clickers in an auditorium, lecturing and interweaving the lecturing with questions. And then in AP 50, w no lectures, just a reading. The students were able to accomplish that same uh, gain. In the University of Arkansas, very different population of students. They did a course revision based on the preliminary version of my manuscript a few years ago, and their normalized FCI gain doubled. And here's an email I got from a high school teacher recently. I recently completed post-testing for my AP physics classes. As, the, as I've done for the 15 years, I've collected pre-post FCI scores. This year's normalized gain was 0.7, a significant improvement over past years, typically in the 0.55 to 0.6 range. Well, we only used the textbook for part of the year. It didn't come up uh, out in time for them for the whole year. I think your text was one of the reasons for the jump this year. So the book has been out for nine months in the US. These are the current adoptions, actually a couple of months ago, and in Canada. And there are now three more universities in Canada. And what's interesting is to see the broad range. I mean, community colleges, two-year colleges, and R1 universities, you know, like University of Pennsylvania, University of Minnesota, and so on. Williams College, which is the number one college in, in, uh, in the US. And what's also interesting is to see how people have adopted the book in different models of teaching. In the traditional approach, they don't, and some of these institutions do that, they don't require anything before class. And then in class, the instructor goes over, covers the, the white book. Some have it partially flipped. They ask the students to read the conceptual part before class. And then in class, the instructor goes over the quantitative parts. And then there are some outliers, like myself, who go wild and ask the students to read the entire book <laughs> before class. And then in class, we focus more on the type of stuff that's in the uh, black book. Again, this picture from my class that really shows it is possible to make physics fun. And the only reason I was able to do that really is because I was able to offload a lot of the teaching to the book, which is what a book really should be doing, right? So that we can focus on different types of activities in, in, uh, in the classroom. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Frankly, I don't know, because I, I've only taught engineers and pre-meds. I, I, um, maybe I'm a masochist, I don't know, but I always seek out the students who don't want to learn uh, <laughs> physics. Um, 
um, to me, you know, you can take the physics majors. I mean, somebody who has decided to major in physics will learn physics no matter what. I mean, I'm probably a prime example of that, right? I switched from astronomy to physics, and then in physics I, I realized, you know, it's not that different from astronomy, but I'd already switched one, so I just hung in there, even though really as an undergraduate, I kept thinking I'm, I'm not really doing what I want to do. It was only, it was probably the research that kept me going because as an undergraduate I was actually doing some research with a research group. And as a graduate student, then when I, that's when I really rediscovered the beauty of doing phys physics. So I think most of the students who decide to stick in physics, they learn not because of the way they were taught, but they learn in spite of it because they have this intrinsic motivation to continue. That probably represents most of us here, right? Um, in, in a sense, you could take us and put us in a closet for four years and we'd come out having learned physics, right? So, so that means that the role of the teacher becomes less important because there's this, this intrinsic motivation. So I've always asked myself, how can I help the students who do not want to learn physics? Believing also, but again, that's a belief, I have no data for that, that what benefits the non-major should in principle also benefit the major, right? I mean, there's no excuse not to do a better job for those who have an intrinsic motivation to learn. So we should really take that and apply to them. But unfortunately, I, since I've never taught the majors, other than filling in for my colleagues from time to time, I, I, I can't tell you the answer to that question. So I really like, enjoyed how you, um, you know, changed the order in your, your textbook. Um, one thing that I found hard as a student to grasp about conservation of energy was that it always seemed like a definition, like you defined a new type of energy so that it was conserved. Um, and so you said that you came up with like an experimental way to verify uh, conservation of energy. It was really impressive for the um, elastic. Yeah. The temptation was very big. Uh, have you read uh, Feynman's introduction with the blocks yeah, and, 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 and Dan, Dennis the Menace yeah. who, yeah, okay. So, so I, I was very tempted to follow that first. And, but please finish, um, I'm sorry. So yeah, like I was just interested in how you made it seem like conservation of energy wasn't this trivial thing that you could find to be true. How did you make it sound like it was a, an interesting Well, I, I don't, trivial is probably not the right word. Not, nothing is, is ever, Ever, ever trivial, but I, I'm an experimentalist, and maybe that's, that explains my innate desire to want to explain things on, by observation. In fact, even Feynman in his introduction says that physics is an experimental science, even though he was a theorist. Um, which is why, you know, after looking at Feynman's introduction, probably, and staring at the screen for a year, not knowing what I was gonna do with energy, I was really happy when I finally realized this little thing that I, that, I, uh, that I told you. But still, in a sense, what Feynman says at the beginning of the, I don't know, are people familiar with Dennis the Menace and the Bricks? It's, it's a beautiful little thing to, to read. It's true, we discover forms of energy by looking for missing energy, right? And in a sense, with the, with the cart hitting the spring and saying the energy has gone into changing the state of the spring, I'm making that same statement. But I probably make it a little bit less abstract yeah. than, than, than Feynman does. You can get it back in that case because, because this, it's reversible. Had I used an, a raw egg rather than a spring, you know, that, that, that energy would not have come back. But also, if I would have filmed it and played the film backwards and would you, you would have seen the egg apart and then also assemble itself, you would have said, wait a minute. I have, by the way, a beautiful classroom experiment. It's illustrated in the book uh, to show that. I have this cart. Um, this Pascal card that has on top a contraption where there, there's a scaffold and the scaffold has a lot of little springs hanging 
with masses, and the springs have different lengths, right? So, so you can shake it, and all of these things start to you know jiggle around. There's a lot of energy in there, but it's totally incoherent, right? So I can shake it, I can do it, shake it, and then put it next to a stop, and you can look at it, and it shakes for about a minute, but the cart doesn't move. I can then take the cart and shove it with all the things at rest, and shove it so the whole cart goes, and it hits a stop, and it doesn't bounce back. What happens is all these things start jingling, jiggling, right? So it shows the dissipation of energy. So I can bring in this idea of dissipation very early on. And I, I think, in a sense, it brings such a more um, pleasing and more modern idea of what energy really is. So, um, so with your colleagues at Harvard, have they, what have they thought of your different initiatives and have they taken any of them on? Oh, I ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to tell you a story here. When I, a lot of people ask me, you know, what about peer instruction? Does everybody at Harvard teach using peer instruction? You know, we very much have a every tub on his own or her own bottom approach. You know, you teach your course, you teach your course, you teach your course, I teach my course. We just go to our classroom, the door closes. I never find out what happens in your course. And we, you know, we don't. We talk about research. We don't talk about teaching. So. After I developed peer instruction at Harvard, nobody knew what I was doing at Harvard. Nobody. Right? And nobody was really interested either. Um, but at some point, I started talking about it, not at Harvard, but at other places. And, and, and I started to get invited because of the data. And at some point, I couldn't handle the invitation anymore. I wrote the book, Peer Instruction and User's Manual, which came out in 1996. A year later, people at Stanford saw that book come from Harvard, Peer Instruction and User's Manual. And they thought, oh, they're using peer instruction at Harvard. We better do it too. <laughs> so they started to implement peer instruction. They started to implement peer instruction in their introductory courses. A month later, or a few months later, one of my colleagues gives a colloquium at, at Stanford and gets told, hey, we're using your colleague Mazur's method in our classes. What's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> they would come back to me and they say, I was just at Stanford and I hear that they're using your method. What is it that you're doing? So what I did had to be validated outside before it got adopted inside. The psychology of change is really interesting. Now, of course, there are a lot of colleagues who are doing it, but the book, I haven't really talked to them. I, I, I've given them a free copy of my book. I mean, they have to buy into it themselves. You know, you can't force people to do. Well, they haven't asked me to talk about my book yet. Besides, there's nothing more intimidating than to change things in your own institution. So the idea had momentum, and we'll go to the next <laughs> question. <laughs> the question about the fourth concept of inventory. Yeah. So the 30 questions that focus quite um, narrowly on... Very narrowly. ...and force, yet yep. everyone likes to use it to talk about overall um, standard yeah. concept. Oh, I really would like that. I mean, in fact, there are a number of instruments that measure uh, other things. However, I don't have a complete, the, the problem is, it's, it's like, you know, becoming a frequent flyer on an airline, and, you know, you get hooked, and therefore you only fly that airline even if you have to make a stop somewhere else. You know, I have so much data on the FCI that if I start to use another instrument, I can no longer compare with other classes at Harvard, with classes here, there. And I think there are many reasons not to use the FCI. For me, it was a fantastic eye-opener because it told me, Eric, your lecturing sucks, <laughs> and you better do something else in your class. That's what it essentially told me. And, and I think in, in that respect, the FCI has been tremendously valuable in the physics community because it's open in a similar way, the eyes of many, many other, uh, many other instructors. Um, and, but, but you know, in terms of testing other uh, concepts, uh, it'd be good to have another instrument. Uh, there's only so much testing I can do on my students before they get tired of all the testing. I measure their self-efficacy, their attitudes towards learning, uh, the FCI, the CSEM as a pretest, as a post-test, you know, so. At some point, you, you can't add another test. But I agree, it will be really good at some point, particularly when this approach to teaching, energy and momentum before force, 
start to get wider acceptance to develop one that actually looks at the understanding of energy and momentum and compares, let's say, the standard curriculum to the one that I'm proposing here. I see. Well, I'd, I'd love to, uh, I, I, I think that I, I'd love to talk about that. So maybe that in a more informal setting after this, we can continue this discussion. Just another question. Um, so as you know, when you defend your PhD in Leiden, you do it with a series of studies. Are you from Leiden? I, I did my PhD there. Oh. Um, but you, you have a series of propositions that structure yes. things. Yes. Some of those are from your thesis and some of those are most of them are outside. They're actually meant to be outside. Or, or a number has to be meant to be even outside the discipline. That's right. What, what the first one that I developed in, in my PhD was that it's remarkable that the vast majority of professional astrophysicists receive no training in the five key aspects of their day-to-day -day work, those being statistics, programming, writing, teaching, or management. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you've done Very good. I like your, that. Your approach, it seems to me, does and so from your last lecture, you did the last three really beautifully. And I'm just wondering, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you had something to say about statistics and your computation in the way that you put this uh, course together, or whether you see any obvious opportunities for that. Yeah, I, I think I have to disappoint you. Um, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with your proposition, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, I taught myself programming as a graduate student, and I don't know when you graduated, I, I defended my PhD in 1981, so the university had one mainframe computer in the Rekensentrum, I think it was called, um, and you had to carry these big boxes of 2,000 punch cards to it. And you know, I never received any formal training in uh, programming, and I couldn't agree more knowing how to program for any scientist, not just an astrophysicist, I mean, any scientist is crucially important, and it's not typically part of the curriculum. And likewise, statistics, and, and not just the type of um, statistics that is taught in a, in, a, in a laboratory course, but I would say even the type of statistics that's much more relevant in astrophysics, high energy physics, or social sciences, because I mean, that's, they're very closely related, is crucially important. But there's only so much you can do in one course, right? I, I, I think in the overarching competencies for my course, you'll see some, uh, some things that would probably fit quite closely. Uh, and I think that what we really need to do is sit down as a department or as a school and ask ourselves, what are the type of fundamental skills that everybody who gets a diploma from our department or our school should really know? And I, I would definitely include them there. I did not see my book is already pretty fat. I did not see any way of uh, incorporating that as well. But, but I couldn't agree more. We need to do that. No questions? Okay. Uh, hi, I have a bit more practical question from the lecturing point of view. I flipped my classroom this year, and a amount of emails I'm getting from students about questions. So they have really much in astronomy and much in physics. So they have pre-reading and text, and I do the similar thing as you. I look at the questions with perform works and then discuss them in lectures. But when we had three lectures, somehow we, I don't know, maybe because I was there, the students had a chance to ask, and I would flip cl classroom, they're liking it, but they're sending me questions, I get like 20 questions an hour sometimes. That's <laughs> your, <laughs> I'm, I'm asking questions. You know, it's, it's actually, it's actually. It Does your rotation fixes that, or did, are you still getting emails and questions? Okay. So, so, so one thing is, is, is uh, you point out something that I, I, I notice too, and, and, and a lot of people are noticing, and if you're not careful, you can interpret it the wrong way. Right? I mean, giving a lecture, and have everybody walk away without any question, because you know how it is in a lecture, right? You lecture a few minutes, and they say, does anybody have a question? Anybody? And you know, the, the students look down. They don't want to make eye contact. Um, you know, it's very easy to fool yourself into believing no questions. I've done a, I've done a good job. Um, but the problem is there are no questions because the students haven't even begun to learn. 
They've simply taken the information down. So now you get students in your flipped classroom to think about the material before class and in class, and all of a sudden there is this avalanche of questions. An avalanche of questions. And it's very easy to think, oh my God, I must have done a terrible job. <laughs> you know, if I lectured, there were no questions, everything was clear. The students think it's clear, you think it's clear. And, and you teach interactively, and there's all this confusion that normally is swept under the rug that just, you know, is in your face. Yeah, I had that. It was a big problem because I, I'm one person. I cannot handle, you know, the dozens of questions coming in. So the annotation software actually took care of that. So I would say you need that annotation software. Yes. <laughs> I'll give you my card. So was, oh, sorry, Did I give you my card? So it was a it was a follow up to the, the annotation software. You mentioned it was asynchronous. Did you find that there was a um, to to make it more timely? Could you give extra points or however to to try to get these questions answered sooner? I mean, very often students will ask a question, and that was they'll be stuck on that. And if if an answer comes three days later, maybe that's not quite quickly enough. How do you get around that problem? Uh, well, I mean, the longer you wait for answering questions, the bigger the chances that somebody else has answered it, right? So I find, I find that, yeah, we, we looked at timing a lot, and we looked at the incentives for timing. So the one that I presented in my, my previous talk is the one that we found got the most students to read it before you know, we really needed the material in the classroom. What it's optimum, I don't know yet. So right now we're working with a slightly different interface than the one I showed you. It, it is, first of all, the software is connected to, the software is connected to uh, their social profiles, Facebook or Twitter, right? and it steals the information out of that um, profile. So you log in with Twitter, or you log in with Facebook, and then it, it basically has your picture and your name. And, and, and it actually looks like a chat. I wanted, to, it, I wanted it to look like, I wanted it to look not like, you know, a dry, boring discussion like the one I, I prepared. I wanted it to look like a social interaction on the platform that they work with. So it really looks like a chat. You see the picture and a bubble, and the picture and a bubble. So it becomes more like, a, like the interaction with which the students are normally uh, accustomed, accustomed to. I hope that that is going to be a further incentive. We, we're only rolling that out over the summer, so I, haven't, I don't have any experience using that yet. And you can get them to automatically follow you at Eric underscore Missoula. Get your follow oh, I, <laughs> I, 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 I put my Twitter handle on, on, the, uh, on the syllabus, but it's actually not that many Harvard students are on Twitter, so. <laughs> Well, thank you, folks. I think great interactions. A uh, couple of things I found. I think three words that describe, I think, some of the things Eric was doing. Inspirational. I think he's passionate about what he's doing. But also, too, just in the generosity he's given us in terms of engaging with us. So put your hands together for Eric. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was very kind of you. This has been a Spindle Introduction.